Good morning, Grace Point. My heart is so happy and hopeful today because today is the day that we begin our crawl, walk, run approach. And that means that not only are there some of you looking on screens in your homes, but we have people who are grouped and gathered in groups of 10 and they are with others right now. And listen, I know this is not run. Run is all of us in a room together, once again rejoicing, just praising. God together. This is crawl. But listen, crawl is the beginning, right? So it's the beginning of a, a hopeful progression. And I'm just so thankful for all of you, whether you're at home or whether you're here at the church, we are beginning again. We are reopening. And what an incredible thing to be able to celebrate and to say, especially after all of these weeks of being apart. So I'm just so happy and just so hopeful for all that God has in store today. Wherever you are, whether you're at home in your living room or whether you're grouped right now at the church facilities, in groups of 10, let me just say, I hope you came prepared to worship God. I hope you came prepared to pray. I hope you came prepared to be in God's word. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our service begins in three, two, one. Well, good morning, Grace Point, and welcome to church. Some of you are in the church building this morning getting to praise together, and that's such an exciting thing. No matter where you are, we're going to start off our time together in worship. Won't you stand and sing? The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't grieve it. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory.
continue on in worship together.
Well, like I said, my heart is happy and hopeful. And whether you're watching in a screen or, or, or listen, huddled in groups of 10, how awesome is it to say that? I just want to keep our hearts and our attention, our focus on Jesus Christ. Isn't it great to be able to sing, even if it's through a mask? And listen, I know masks are uncomfortable. They're hot. They're, they're not uh, fun to wear. But I just appreciate the fact that at our church, love is shaping character right now. Thank you for being gracious and putting into practice uh, our values. Uh, and listen, I want you to be aware of what's happening, whether you're at home or whether you're uh, meeting in groups of 10. And um, the way to do that is A, through talking to each other, but B, through going to the URL on your screen. GPN.church forward slash bulletin is a great place to gather information. Well, each week we give you a number, 630-528-2526, 630-528-2526, and we ask that you would type in the word here or the word pray. Now, if you're meeting in groups of 10, we know you're here because you had to sign up in order to meet in groups of 10. And so you don't have to type in the word here, thank you. But if you're at home, listen, you would be such an encouragement to us to let us know that we're not alone in this and that you're with us in spirit and that you're still hanging in there. And I know it's been week after week after week, but you're still in this thing. Would you please type in the word here? And then, listen, our prayer list has grown exponentially, but so too have our prayer lives. Because when times get tough, uh, God's people start praying because we know where the power is. And so I want to encourage you, uh, you can type in a prayer request or if you're huddled in a group of 10, I have a special instruction for you. Here it is. Take a moment and push pause on the recording. We have deliberately in this morning service decided not to premiere this uh, as a live event. And the reason for that is precisely so you can hit pause at moments like these. If you're huddled in a group of 10, that means you can share prayer requests and pray for each other. And that is a great use of fellowshipping together. So go ahead and hit pause and take some time to pray for one another. 630-528-2526 is also a great place for you to text in any questions you may have throughout the course of the message. Um, and I will do my best to answer those tomorrow from 3.30 to 4.30 on Facebook Live and Instagram Live. We want to continue on with our worship service, and we're going to do that through the giving of our tithes and offerings. We've gotten a whole lot more used to digital giving, and it's so important that in our giving, we're also being faithful to give. We give because God gave to us. We give because he asks us to give. We give because we want to be obedient to the word of God. We give for so many reasons, including the reason of worship, that when we give, when we're obedient and submissive to God, God sees that and recognizes that as an act of worship. And so we're very unapologetic about this moment because we know this is God's moment and not our moment. We didn't create this for us. But God loves to expand his kingdom through the giving of tithes and offerings by his people. gpn.church uh, forward slash give is the URL you can give at. And uh, in these days of social distancing and all the rest of it, um, digital giving has been a great lifeline. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts and continue on in worshiping, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. <sighs> Father God, Thank you for the opportunity to gather. And I know we can't all gather together. We're very much in a crawl, walk, run kind of a progression here. And we're all at different points of this process. And that's okay. Your church has always been diverse. But God, your church has also always been unified by your spirit been unified by the cross and the resurrection. It's been unified by your vision for your local church. And so, Father God, we are unified by you. Some are gathered in groups of 10. And Father God, we have been waiting and praying for this day 
Today is a day of encouragement for us. But Father God, our hearts long for a day and a time where all of us can once again, without reservation, without any kind of distancing, once again, just lift our hands in total worship to you, declaring that you are God of your people. And we want the nations and the world and creation to know that we belong to you. So Father, we worship you in spirit and in truth. Because the truth is we need you now more than ever before. Thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the opportunity to be your people. Thank you for the opportunity to reopen. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be seen again I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be We are in week three, uh, examining the life of Abraham, who's also known as Abram, who is considered the father of faith. And through his life, we are learning how to live by faith. Now, in week one, we saw that God spoke to Abram while he was in Ur of Chaldees, and God t took him down to the land of Canaan. And there in Canaan, chapter 12, verse 7, he showed Abram that Canaan would be the promised land. Remember, Abram's wife is barren. Uh, he can't have children, but God has promised him that he would make him a great nation. He promised him that he would give him land. He promised that his reputation would be great. He would be famous. He promised that he would bless him and those who curse him, he would curse. And so God has said, Abram, I'm with you. I'm sticking with you. And Abram has been worshiping God all along the way. And then last week, we saw Abram come up from Egypt, and he was wealthy. God was blessing, and there was this conflict that he had with his nephew Lot. Lot had a secondhand kind of a faith, Abram had a firsthand faith, and through that, we learned the importance of owning faith for ourselves. that you can't just skirt along on a secondhand kind of a faith. It, you have to own the faith. You have to own the choices. You have to take personal responsibility for making decisions based on the priorities of God's word, and there's just no substitute. You're either in or you're out. You can't like fly next to a plane. You'll drop. So you have to own your faith. It has to be a firsthand kind of a thing. And what you discover over time, of course, is that faith also owns and carries you. And now we are in week three. And this week, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 is perhaps uh, the most studied chapter on the life of Abraham, known here as Abram. God is going to rename him later on. Uh, this chapter has been picked apart. It has gone right to the trees. And the challenge is that uh, scholars and academics and churches tend to miss the forest for the trees. And the trees make up a forest, and the forest is there for a reason. And so I want us to pan out and look at the forest of this chapter. We're going to read the whole chapter together. This is the chapter where God once again affirms his covenant, his promise with Abram. And some of you are thinking, didn't we already cover this? Like he promised uh, Abram uh, a land, a reputation, a future, all those things in Genesis chapter 12. And then last week we were in Genesis chapter 13 and God tells him again, look, as, as much as the dust is on the earth, I'll make your descendants that numerous. And so God says it again in Genesis 13. And now here we are in Genesis 15 and the whole chapter is about God's covenant with Abram. And the answer is, yeah, God has been reassuring Abram along the way. And so this is really the chapter that gets most studied because of the way that God practically affirms his promise. So Genesis chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you, go to God's word. Genesis chapter 15, go to God's word. God is speaking through this text, this is not just a promise to Abram, but because of how this covenant is played out through history, this is a promise that impacts all of us. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to pick it up with verse 1. Here we go. After these things, the word of the Lord, oh, I'm sorry, won't you stand with me in honor of God's word? Some of you were already standing in anticipation, so I apologize. Stand in honor of God's word. Here we go. We'll start over. Chapter 15, verse 1. 
After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. That was my question mark. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. When the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I will give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Let's pray. Father God, that's, uh, that's a lot of people to name. But Father God, you know our name. You know us not just as a people, as Grace Point. You know each one of us by name. You meet us where we are, even in the same way that in this text you met Abram where he was and in the context that he was in. And we're asking you, Father, to meet us where we are now. Gathered differently in different places, but committed to you and to your word. We don't live according to our word. We live according to your word, which is a filter for our attitudes and our actions. In the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Well, after reading the chapter... There's a lot of trees, right? <laughs> you, you have a lot of questions. Like, Derek, what about the birds? Can we talk about the birds for a second? He cuts up everybody else except the birds and then birds. I can't, like, you want to get deep into the trees on this, but I'm going to help you to pan out to the forest, okay? We can talk about birds and the rest of it on Monday, but for now, I need you to see what's happening and see the big picture and know how it applies to faith. Because how it applies to faith is important. It's critical for you and I, right? That's why this is in here. It's not just historical. Take a look at what happened. It's personal. So I want us to focus on how and why it's personal. Here's the first application that we can look at. Here's the principle. Don't assume you have a solution God hasn't thought of. Don't assume you have a solution that God hasn't thought of. There's this great passage in the, the first part of this chapter, right, where Abram suddenly introduces us to a whole new figure. He's like, 
O Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? And we know that from Genesis chapter 11, even before 12, where it says that Sarai is barren. And then along comes Lot, who is the closest thing that he might have to a biological son. He's the, his nephew, the son of his brother. And then Lot goes his own way. We saw that last week. And here he says, what will you give me for I am continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And he asks it as a question. It's, this is the heir of my house, like th this guy. And by the way, he's a good and faithful servant. Some scholars think that Eliezer is the one that Abram sends to go get Isaac a wife later on. So he trusts this guy implicitly. And Abram is doing what Abram can do, right? He's looking around and he's going, okay, I don't see how this is possible. Like, she's barren. You know she's barren. You've told me I'm going to have kids. You've told me to look at the dust of the earth thanks. You've told me to look at the stars in the heaven. Okay, thank you for your assurances. You've promised I'll be a great nation. God, God, I believe you, but what about Eliezer? Maybe he's the solution that you mean. <laughs> doesn't that sound like you and I? Don't we some, doesn't God give us a promise and we go, okay, okay, how can I make this promise happen? How can I see this promise come to fruition? Sure, God, it's you, but you clearly want me to participate. And so maybe you want me to come up with a solution you haven't thought of. And that's a challenge for us because God is omniscient. He's all-knowing, which means that sometimes God is actually thought of, well, not sometimes, all the time, God has thought of solutions. God has thought of every aspect. And we're called to be faithful. We're called to do our part. Abram is certainly doing his part, but God has already told him twice before, listen, I, I'm, you're going to have descendants. And if you look at the original language, God isn't being obtuse. He's not like, you know, you'll have descendants somewhere. If you squint, you look sideways. He's a nice guy. He'll be your descendant. Uh, you'll adopt him, whatever it is. He's not saying that. He's saying, look, you're going to have biological descendants. I'm going to bless you this way. They're going to come through your lineage. God was clear from the very beginning on that. Abram, though, comes up with the solution that he thinks God may, maybe hasn't thought of and could use. Like, God, have you considered this? Like, is this the guy? Is, because he's a good guy, and what do I need to do? And God comes back, and he assures him, look, I've thought of it all. I'm telling you it's going to be a biological son. I am going to bless you through your descendants, your literal descendants. Don't assume in a life of faith that you have a solution God hasn't thought of. See, the task of faith is to discover and follow the solution God has thought of for you. It's not for you to come up with solutions that God is supposed to adopt. And so often, I find myself in a position where I am suggesting to God rather than asking God what his solution for me is. And that's the key. The key here is, God, what is your solution for me? Here's the second thing I want you to see. Know what you can and can't do. Know what you can and can't do. What can Abram do in this moment? Well, he can believe God. Now, that sounds like a pretty passive thing, but it's not. It's not. It's a very, very active thing. Listen, you are responsible for believing God. God is responsible for his timing. God is responsible for his justice. But you are responsible for believing what he tells you and acting on it. Your decision is one to believe. Believing is something that you can do. Maybe one of the more famous verses in all of Scripture comes from this chapter, and it's in verse 6 of chapter 15. What's it say? It says, And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness, as being in right alignment with him, as living rightly. Believing is something that you can do. Righteousness, right living, being counted right, is something that is counted to you as a result. And sometimes we get those things backwards. We think that, that righteousness is what we do. No, you can live rightly. You can make choices to live rightly. But making those choices comes from the belief that those are the right choices. So belief is what you're actually exercising. The righteousness is counted to you. That's where God goes, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Come and share in many things. 
Right? That's the reward of God. God says, look, you're doing it well. Uh, Michael Card has one of my favorite songs on faith, a song called That's What Faith Must Be. And he says, to hear with my heart, to see with my soul, to be guided by a hand I cannot hold, to trust in a way that I cannot see, well, that's what faith must be. What can Abram do? He can exercise faith. He can believe in that which has not yet happened. One of the best definitions that we get in the Bible on faith, like what is faith anyway, comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and then 2. Listen to this. Now, faith is the assurance, (coughs) excuse me, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. So it's the assurance of things hoped for. Like I believe it, but it's the conviction of things not yet seen. So I believe you're going to do it even if I don't see it. Now listen to these verses in Hebrews chapter 11 because the author continues describing faith and he continues describing it as it pertains to Abram. Listen to this. Picking it up from verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, Genesis chapter 12. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He went south. Verse 9, by faith, he went to live in the land of the promise, 12 verse 7. As in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he, Abraham, was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him, considered God faithful, who had promised. Therefore, From one man, and him as good as dead, that's God's way of saying, from one guy who was really, really old, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, a direct reference to Genesis 15, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. What's God tell Abram in 15, he says, 400 years. So they die in faith, not having received all the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. I'm in Canaan, but my home is with you, God. I'm in Egypt, but my home is with you, God. You are where my home is. Picking up with verse 15, Hebrews 11, still there. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, anytime there's a therefore, you pay attention. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. Know what you can and can't do. You can believe, you can have faith that God is a God of the promise and God fulfills his promises. You can live your life based on that unknown horizon, but with the certainty, with the assurance that you are living your life on rock solid land, not on sinking sand. Why? Because God can be trusted. At the same time, God can do the things that you can't do. What does God tell Abram in the passage? He says, look, the people are going to come back up. They're first, they're going to be enslaved. All that happened. Then they're going to come back up. And he says, the reason it's going to take that long is because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. That's verse 16. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay, who, who in the world are the Amorites? Well, the Amorites are some of those peoples that are listed that are already living in the land of Canaan. 
More specifically, they are the mountain peoples. They are the people of the high places. They are the people who build altars on the higher high places, including altars to gods like Molech, where they were practicing child sacrifice in the name of their own worship. If you look at Leviticus chapter 18, you'll see some of the sinful practices of the Amorites. And one day, 400 years later, Joshua is going to come in and he's going to start to sweep out the Amorites. He's going to start to do battle with them and give them a reckoning. What God is saying here is, listen, I have a sense, Abram, of timing. And we talk about this all this all the time, that God has a sense of chronos and kairos. Chronos is the date. Today is May 31st. That's chronological. That's in time. But God also has a sense of timing. And God's timing is perfect. And here's what God says in Genesis 15. He says, look, my timing for the fruition of people coming into this land is not now. My timing is then. Why? Because I am God and I am looking at the acts of all the people on the earth. And I have a sense of when I'm going to be sick of this and their judgment is coming and I know who I'm going to use to bring that judgment about for me to be able to use them. These things have to happen in them so they need to go into slavery in order that they can come out of that and I can do a great work in them. Why? Because I need them to learn how to depend on me. That's going to require them to follow me as I lead them to the promised land. And so I'm trying to teach my people. I'm trying to shape my people. Not just for their sake but also for judgment on those who don't follow God. Abram can't control any of that. That's nothing that Abram can actually do. What Abram can do is believe. So know what you can and can't do. Know what you can and can't do. So pivotal to faith. Here's the third thing I want you to see. God is willing to practically assure us he is able. God is willing to practically assure us he is able. Notice how the chapter begins. This is Genesis 15, starting with verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. So God speaks to Abram. What's he say? Listen to this. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. I love that. I love that God steps in front of Abram. Why why does he have to say fear not? Probably because Abram was a little afraid. Probably because he was wondering, like, Am I going to make it through? Like, this is difficult. You gave me a promise. I risked everything. Is this going to work? And God comes in. He says, Abram, fear not. I'm going to assure you again. I am your shield. I love this. I love that Abram has to be reassured over and over again because it means he's human. It means that, you know, we tend to look at Abraham and we go, well, I can never be that. Listen, he is you. In the sense that all of us need assurance and God is willing to do that. God comes to Abram and he says, fear not for I am your shield. Maybe that's the word you need today. You're looking around, people wearing face masks, they have their plastic shields. And God is saying, oh, fear not. I am your shield. I will protect you. I will see you through. God was willing to assure And he was willing to do that in a very practical way. Now, I I call these practical assurances God nods. I borrow that term, God nod, because I heard a missionary years ago use it. And they were referring to all these little moments where God assures us that he's there, that he's doing things. Some of us have big dreams for our lives. We believe that God has big things in store for us. And God talks about having a hope and a future for us. And sometimes it can get discouraging along the way. God, God, what is it that you have for me? And isn't it interesting how God says, look, I haven't left you. God gives us these little God nods, these little moments along where he goes, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm going to assure you. And he tends to do that in practical ways. Lord, would you answer this prayer? Yeah, I'll answer that prayer. Now that may not speak to the overarching thing that we're going for, but it's a little moment where God delivers, God comes through. And it just reminds us that over and over and over again, God is willing to enter into our world to practically assure us in ways. You know, uh, I was out 
working in our garden and I'd prayed for encouragement that morning and along comes this parade, the highlight of my entire COVID existence. This parade comes and people just willing to encourage me. And I'm just telling you, that was a God nod. That was a moment that was of assurance where God practically used people in cars with signs and their thoughtfulness just to do something great. It's not the whole journey, but it's a God nod along the way. Now, what does God do here? Well, a lot has been made about this chapter and the ancient oath that is taken. God steps into Abram's world and he practically assures Abram in a way that was contextually and historically appropriate for Abram's understanding of promises and oaths. The understanding of promises and oaths and the way that we symbolize that would change over time. By the time we get, for instance, to Ruth, there's an exchanging of sandals. Today, or we might shake hands or sign a contract. We'll hold up our hands and put the other hand on the Bible. Uh, we'll sign a marriage certificate, and that certificate has a legal and binding uh, um, uh, form that helps us be in compliance, but also understand the significance significance of the promises that we are making to God. And so God says, okay, here, here's what's going to happen, Abram. I'm going to step into your world and uh, I'm going to, with you, make an oath, an assurance for you in a practical way that you can understand. God in no way has to do this. Not in any way, shape, or form. He's already given his word in chapter 12. He's reassured him in chapter 13. Look, as, the, as much as the dust is on the earth, that's going to be your offspring. He could have said, look, I'm God. My word is enough. What are you doing? But God says, look, here, here's what I want you to do. Go get some animals. Cut them in half. Lay them on each side of each other. Now, this was not a new practice. God didn't, like, invent this at this moment. This was a common practice, and the reason you used animal sacrifice was to indicate the seriousness of the promise. If anyone breaks this promise, may my body be physically broken, right? It's penalty of death kind of stuff. And it's interesting that it's God who goes between the pieces. God is the one who's going to fulfill those promises. But God does that. He says, okay, Abram, in the way that you understand oaths, what do you need for assurances? What do you need? Go prepare the sacrifice. This is the 30,000 foot view. Go, pre go prepare the sacrifice so that I can assure you that I am able to do what I promise you that I'm going to do. How good is God? Like, honestly, God does that in your life. God does that in my life. He enters into our world in contextual ways that we understand, historically appropriate ways that we can understand. And he gives us assurances, practical assurances that we can bank on. He says, look, my promises are mine to fulfill because you know what you can and can't do. Point two. So point three, what do you do? You rest and you trust that God is willing to practically assure us that he is able. Now, let me just give a word on this because God has given us promises. He's given us promises by his word and we can get pretty impatient and sometimes we think, well, maybe God hasn't actually heard us, or maybe uh, we're the exception to the rule. God will fulfill his promises everywhere else with everyone else <laughs> except for me. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I certainly have. In the New Testament church, they lived early on as if Jesus was going to return then. Things got bad. Things got really bad. The persecution was horrific. And they were convinced that God was going to come in their lifetimes. And then over time, some of the apostles, apostles like Peter, even as he was talking about perseverance, he began to get a sense of, okay, wait a second, he might not come back in my lifetime. I'm going to live with the posture as if he's coming back in my lifetime, but he may not come back in my lifetime. And Peter writes these words because he's been thinking about the slowness and the quickness of God in terms of being able to fulfill his promises. L listen to this. This is 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Peter writes, he, God, is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness to be. 
we can get pretty impatient, but in the scope of eternity, in the scope of time, this is a very, very short moment. Even our lifespans are short moments. As I get older and I look back, I see that some periods of time seem to go back in a blink. But I know that when I was going through them, they felt like they were going to last forever. I mean, I thought puberty was going to last forever. I thought I would always have pimples, like it's never going to get past this. And yet, it was a moment in time in retrospect. God wasn't slow in keeping his promises. God wasn't slow in that, but he had a sense of chronos and kairos to his promises. And so we learned to trust him. Now, what did that cause the early church to do? It caused them to say, Lord, we trust you. We believe your promises. We're going to persevere, but we are not giving up hope. And so this word springs up, Maranatha, Lord, come, the sense of anticipation that you will keep your promise. Do you hear that? You will. The, the thing that's certain is that God will keep his promise. So Lord, come. He is not slow in keeping his promises. As some understand, slowness to be in a life of faith is a life of anticipation. It's a life of knowing that God will fulfill what he promised. And he has not left us alone. He is reassuring us with God nods. He is helping us along the way, and God is eminently practical. We're going to turn our focus and our attention to a time of Lord's Supper together and... Um, whether you're at home and you have some elements close by or maybe you've picked those up from the church earlier or whether you're gathered in groups of 10 and you're able to participate in this moment, I want us just to prepare our hearts and our minds. I want us just to consider for a moment, just to reflect. Lord, do I trust you? Am I living rightly with you? Would you count it to me as righteousness? Just pause. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Father God, we... We believe you. We know that there are things that you can do that we can't, that there's no solution you haven't thought of. And Father God, what we really need is the insight to see your solutions. The belief to trust those solutions and to live with a hope that anticipates that those solutions will come to their fruition. And we want to live our lives as men and women who are living by faith. Father God, do a work in us. Scrub our hearts clean. If there's anything that we're doing that gets in the way of who you want us to be, Father, forgive us. And help us to be completely yours. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. What an honor and privilege it is for some of us to gather in groups of 10 and break bread together. You know, this is a pattern of the early church. This is a moment that was instituted by our Lord himself who said, don't don't forget this. You keep doing this. Remember my death until I come. And so you have some cups, some hermetically sealed cups and some wafers. Others of you, you're at home and maybe you've gotten some elements or maybe you've swung by the church to get those elements. I would ask that you would get those out at this time. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Thank you for the promise of the Messiah. Thank you, Father, for Jesus who did come for us. For so many years, it seemed like he was just a promise in the distance and yet your promises are certain and he did come for us and he gave his life for the love that he had for us, for the love you have for us. He gave his life on our behalf. Thank you for a kind of love that reaches into our suffering and brings us hope. Thank you for the kind of love that pulls us together as your church because our hope is in you alone. By his stripes, we are healed. Amen. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for getting to break bread together. We praise you, Father, for the blood that was spilled that covers our sins. That's why we celebrate this. Our sins are covered. We're still sinful, but Father God, you are at work in us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the sacrifice of the cross. Thank you for new life by your Son. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Father God, we remember, and we remember that it's because of this sacrifice that we can live. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's not lost on me that today is also the weekend of Pentecost. Pentecost is that moment where the Holy Spirit came down and began to indwell and begin to talk to, and the gospel was proclaimed to the nations. And in the early church, you would recognize someone by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You would say, okay, they are now a changed person. They are a God-centered person. They belong to Jesus because of the Holy Spirit within them. And so even as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I'm just reminded that we have a commonality because the Holy Spirit is in us because we gave up our lives to Jesus even as he gave his life for us. And we have power because of his resurrection, power in us. And the Holy Spirit even now is talking and helping and teaching uh, on God's behalf to us at this moment and is interpreting what we're saying in our prayers to God at this very moment. We want to close out our time together by singing a song of worship together. Some of us, through masks, and I know they're annoying and hot, but we're going to sing and praise anyway. Some of us in our living rooms, open, wherever you're at, I want to encourage you, take this time, begin to worship the Lord. You know, this is the pattern of Jesus. In the book of Matthew, we're told that after Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper, that they all sang a hymn together and then went to the Mount of Olives. That's right, Jesus sang. You have questions. I have questions. Was he a tenor? Was he a bass? Was he a baritone? I don't know, but I can tell you he worshiped. And so that's so important for us to do together. And so for thousands of years, after Lord's Supper, the church has, church has just worshiped together. And that's what we're going to do at this very moment. We're going to close out our time together in worship. Wherever you are, would you stand and let's sing. Praising God and Jesus. Lord, my soul. without hope the place you begin You'll have made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested my life began Ash was redeemed only beauty remains My of the mark was given Jesus, me. 
pray that your heart is happy and hopeful today. I know this is a taste. It's just a taste for those of you who are gathered around. For those of you who are looking forward to gathering and you're trying to figure out your way forward, that's okay. Remember, love shapes character. We, there's no judgment on any side on this, but I pray that your heart is happy and hopeful that we are beginning to emerge from this thing. And one day, this is the promise of God, we will be reunited and we will get to worship him freely and openly in spirit and in truth. Here's my blessing for us all. May you be reminded that the God we serve is the God of miracles. May your eyes be open to the God nods around you, the indications that he is very much present and active in your life. And may it drive you to a heart of gratitude, a heart of belief, a heart of hopefulness. May others see the way you respond to the circumstances you're in and ask, who are you following? Why do you have such a hope? Where does your peace come from? All so that we can bear testimony that Jesus is Lord. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.